We have a really, really nice uh, lecture for the start. We have our antedros from Plarium. Basically, I mean, everyone knows Plarium, right? One, yeah, 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 I see the Plarium in the audience. Let's, uh, let's clap, let's say hooray. Plarium, one of the biggest, one of the best uh, free-to-play developers in the world. And Aran will tell us about out-of-the-box pair tactics. He will have 20 minutes and then we will move to Q&A. Okay, let's keep it interesting. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you all had a pleasant uh, lunch. So as uh, he introduced, my name is Oren Todoros and I'm the uh, PR specialist for our mobile games at Plarium. Uh, the talk I'm gonna be sharing with you today is called 10 out of the box PR and Marcom tactics. And the goal of this talk is actually to share with you guys some big PR ideas that were executed by some of the brands we all know online and on mobile. Uh, as well as share, you know, get you guys to think about uh, the whole industry in a more creative way and to try creative things when it comes to your PR strategies. So let's dive right into it. Uh, for those who don't know a little bit about Plarium, just to share a few words, Plarium is ranked among the world's leading uh, developers of hardcore strategy titles, uh, specifically for mo mobile and social. Uh, globally, we're about 1,000 employees spread across the US uh, and uh, Europe. Uh, we're now over, uh, like I said, 1,000 employees, 150 million registered users uh, and growing. We're also presenting on the show floor here, so if you haven't had a chance, please do visit our booth. We'd love to uh, get to know you. Uh, we're also hiring, so do visit. So a question I get asked a lot is, what exactly is PR and Marcom, and how does it fit into the whole uh, world of online gaming or mobile gaming? So to keep it as uh, brief as possible for the sake of time, uh, think of it this way. Uh, PR's role is really to maintain your company's reputation, uh, whether it's internally or externally with journalists, media, partners, or anybody else that you might be doing business with, especially with your gamers. Uh, on the other side, when you think about Marcom, uh, Marcom's role is really the um, marketing communication messaging that you put out, the, the way that you communicate with your audience, whether it's, again, internally or externally. So that may be your messaging, the brand story, uh, or how you, you know, hire new people, or how you reach out to journalists. So the messaging or the communication information that you put out is the Marcom side. So how is this put into effect? Uh, at a very high level, the way that we try to work is uh, we try to keep everything on a sort of a tactical plan. So this, again, just to keep things very short, uh, we try to identify our, our main audience. So whether we're trying to reach out to gamers, uh, which is you know the core audience, or we're trying to reach out to journalists. First, it's all about identifying who we want to reach out to. Then we align our PR strategies. So what exactly do we want to tell them? What information do we want to share out there? We execute on these ideas and report back in terms of what worked, what hasn't worked, and how we can how can we improve this this process. So if you have any questions about how to really set up a PR plan, I'll be happy to talk to you guys after this talk. We'll have, uh, I think, five or a few minutes for a Q&A session. All right, so before we really dive into the 10 tips I'll be sharing with you guys, I wanna show uh, three examples of brands that have uh, affected or actually executed on big PR strategies. Some of them have gotten it right, while others, well, not so much. We're gonna take a look at these examples. So the first example I'll be sharing with you guys is one of the most ambitious launches of 2015. Uh, so Candy, uh, King's Candy Crush Soda uh, launched uh, in 2015, and their goal with their main launch was really to celebrate uh, the launch of Candy Crush and to uh, you know, increase exposure for their brand uh, on a wide level. So to do this, uh, they painted, in the UK, they painted the River Thames uh, uh, light shade of uh, Candy Crush Soda purple, uh, which was you know, very, very, uh, fun for them to do. They also uh, worked with the London Orchestra, uh, which played the Candy Crush theme music. And of course, they leveraged all this throughout their social presences. So they used existing content that they already had while building up on their brand story. They did this in a way that brought the, 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 uh, the game to life uh, in, the, in the UK. While in the US, they created big floats around uh, their brand, their, their mascots and so on. And again, shared this throughout all their social presences. Well, the outcome of all this was obviously a lot of exposure through uh, 
well-known media. Everybody loved it. It was very colorful. It was, you know, there was a lot to show around it. Uh, overall, it made people feel good. So good job to them. Another personal example that I really like is the launch of Best Fiends. Have any of you guys heard of uh, this game or the, the company behind it? But Best Fiends is actually a puzzle type game, a, a casual puzzle game. Uh, and the way that they wanted to stand out above all the other puzzle titles out there and to create an effective launch uh, is that they wanted to work with uh, YouTubers. But again, everybody wants to work with YouTubers. And how do you reach the top YouTubers and make it interesting for them to actually want to engage with your game? So basically what they did is they said, okay, we have a $50,000 marketing budget. Let's reach out to YouTubers. And instead of just spending that money, we'll have them donate it to the charity of their choice. So they created sort of a challenge between the top YouTubers, including PewDiePie and all the other guys out there who create great game content. They made them challenge each other. The winner of the, the challenge would, would then have the right to donate that $50,000 prize to the charity of their choice. Again, made people feel good. It got uh, exposure for their game. It got a lot of people viewing the videos around it, and they actually created a follow-up video uh, challenge uh, based around this. So it's not just going out to work, you know, working with YouTubers, it's about finding the best way to do it in the way that makes people actually feel good and want to engage with your game. Now on the flip side of all this, obviously there's always going to be one you know, uh, that's not so great. So what EA did for the launch of uh, their game, uh, Dante's Inferno, well, first of all, the challenge was called Sin to Win, so you already know that there was a problem there somewhere. Uh, what they wanted to do is to have people walk around the event taking pictures with booth babes and posting them on Twitter. Somebody's bright idea, I guess. Uh, well, the outcome of all this was bad publicity. Uh, they had a backlash of journalists where they, you know, they thought it was pretty sexist, which I agree. Uh, it, it objectified women, and the worst of all is that they got their own personal hashtag called EA Fail, which you know, you know, you know you've done something wrong when you get your own hashtag. All right, so why is PR really important when it comes to uh, games? Well, first of all, content creation is constantly changing. The way people are creating content is changing. The way uh, people consume content is constantly changing. And you want to make sure that your story stays out above the rest. You want to make sure that your, you know, your story is actually heard. So. You know, if you think back a, a few short months or years ago, uh, having a good press release, pitching it out to a journalist, would sometimes get you some good coverage. Today, that's not necessarily the case. People are, I mean, everybody's pitching out to journalists at this point. Uh, so you have to really think about how can your story stay uh, ab above the rest, uh, whether it's through written word, sounds, images, and of course, VR content, which is now slowly on the rise. We're, we're, you know, we're just getting started on that, but if you think forward, on how content is going to be supplied or sent out to uh, consumers, VR, in my opinion, is definitely one of the ways that it's going to happen. Uh, people's time is constantly, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very tight resource. People don't have a lot of time to waste. Same thing goes for journalists, same thing goes for your players. If you're not getting to them on, on a level that's highly engaging, or at least on their terms, you're missing out on a big opportunity. So, you know, having your PR strategy right is extremely important. In my personal opinion, the thing that, that makes it the most important is going back to sheer amount of uh, pitches that journalists get. So if you think about it, journalists receive, the top journalists in, uh, in fact, receive between 50 to uh, 100 PR pitches per day. There's no way that anybody can actually manage all that. There's no way anybody can read all of this. So you know, just think of a PR pitch would probably not be the, the best idea. It's probably good to have it as part of your mix, but it's not you know, the definite route to go. So what I'm going to talk about specifically with my uh, tips is we're going to touch on three main uh, topics. We're going to talk about earned media, owned media, and shared media. These are the media channels that you have control over. Uh, I'm going to put aside the whole uh, paid media at this point. I think you guys you know, know well about it. There was a lot of sessions about it. Extremely important as part of the marketing mix. What I focus on specifically is the media that I have more control over without necessarily investing a high budget. So let's dive right into it. Number one, leveraging visual content. Um, I'm curious to hear how many of you guys have actually worked with YouTubers or have tried to reach out to the YouTube community or Twitch? Anybody in this room? All right, so few. Uh, in my opinion, that is you know, gold. If you are able to reach out to these guys and, and know what type of games they like to play, doing the research, figuring out what games they cover, what games get them interested, uh, you are well on your way to receiving a lot of coverage uh, at a fairly low cost. Uh, but again, it really comes down to the type of games. Obviously, uh, casual games do very well when it comes to YouTube or visual content. Uh, just to put some numbers behind this, 
uh, we're expected to see 790 million viewers uh, based around uh, game-related content by 2017. So it's an extremely fast-growing channel. Uh, another uh, interesting stat is that over 1.7 million broadcasters are actually streaming video content right now on Twitch. So there's a lot of video content being put out there. YouTube is well aware of this. Uh, and of course, they launched their own gaming app. Uh, so looking into Twitch and YouTube gaming apps is uh, something that I highly recommend. And why is this really important? Well, if we look at how Minecraft achieved uh, extremely uh, high success, uh, well, they received 47 billion views uh, just by YouTube gamers. Most of it was uh, from YouTube gamers. Very, very, uh, a few amount of that content was actually done uh, by, by Minecraft themselves. And we all know that that was sold uh, to Microsoft for two and a half billion dollars. So understanding YouTube, leveraging video content, leveraging images is one of the tactics that I highly recommend you, uh, that you uh, take on. Next, we have audio content. Another question I'd like to ask is, how many of you actually listen to podcasts uh, on your way to work, back for, you know, back or for work? All right, so there's a few of them. Personally, for me, it's become one of my main sources of content consumption. It's how I stay informed. I have about a 20-minute ride to and from work. I listen to at least one or two podcasts a week. It's something that's very, very much on the rise. And just as YouTube was a few months ago, now, you know, podcast content is definitely taking that stage. So podcasts is something that I would recommend you all look at, uh, and specifically reaching out to uh, podcasters who deal with games, gaming, uh, gaming culture. There's no lack of them. Do your you know, research, find, it, find out where they are. Of course, all these guys are available on Twitter, on Facebook, uh, on LinkedIn. Getting to them is not you know, so difficult. So podcasts is uh, something that I really recommend you look at. Another reason that you should definitely look into podcasts is that only 3% of marketers are actually including podcasts in their marketing mix. So there is a huge amount of content being put out there and a very, very small amount of competitors or uh, you know, g uh, gaming companies actually reaching out to these uh, podcasters. And they actually need the content. They, they want to interview people. They want to talk about things that are interesting. So there's really no reason not to reach out to them. Something that we've done at Plarium is that we've taken our uh, musical scores from our games. So we have about five or six different worlds right now. Uh, from each of our games and we are actually working with the world famous composer called Yes Per Kid who makes a lot of uh, game uh, music. So our fans really love our music. Our, it's, re it's something that we invest heavily in. We've taken the, s the best songs, we've created an album around that and we've promoted it as a standalone album. So that is another marketing channel that we're actually using. It's not creating new content, it's taking stuff that already exists and uh, putting it in the forefront. So amplify your social reach. I think by now everybody knows the importance of being on social. Everybody knows that you need your social presence. You need to be on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on YouTube, and so on. But the thing that really surprises me is that people don't really take the time to figure out how to do it right. Uh, and one of the basic things that people should be doing is finding out what the top hashtags are in the uh, network that you're using. So if you're on Twitter, figure out what people are actually talking about. What hashtags are they using? Figure out who they're, you know, who they're talking to and what they're talking about. It takes a little bit more time, but once you figure that out and you engage with that community and you use the hashtags, it makes a world of difference. So take that time to figure it out. Personally, some of the lesser known channels that I really, really like, and I think this is where a lot of people are discovering games, journalists included, are on Reddit, uh, is on Reddit or Reddit sub channels. Uh, so I don't know how many of you guys are actually on Reddit, but trust me, if you're there and you're active in that community, you are going to make the news quicker than you can actually send out a press release. If you're on there, and people are talking about your game, engaging with it, whether it's in a good or bad way, that's you know, somewhere that people are picking up on. Journalists are on Reddit, sometimes much quicker than they are you know, uh, on checking their email. Product Hunt is also something that's on the rise. It's very good for products, but right now you know, they're testing out games. So you know, stay in that loop and check out Product Hunt for games. And of course, diving into analytics. It's still very surprising that a lot of people are using social network or brands are using it but very few are taking the time to dive into the analytics behind it to figure out what content are your players actually uh, engaging with, uh, whether it's video or Im images or sounds. What are your top posts? Why did they work? What times did they work? Dive into that content. Again, it might take a little bit more time to, get it, uh, to figure it out and to get it right, but it's just as you would do for your user acquisition or any other type of marketing channel. Diving into the analytics for social is a must. One of my favorite uh, tools, uh, not so well known, but it's highly 
uh, important is right tag. And since I talked earlier about hashtags, if you're looking for hashtags within your uh, game's niche, dive into right tag, uh, figure out you know, the services that they use. They actually give you a lot of uh, information, such as what tags you should be using, uh, recommended tags, uh, what are the best times to actually post on, uh, and tons of other recommendations. So this is just a quick tip, righttag.com, uh, one of my favorite go-to services. So this is actually a fun slide. Uh, utilize online services. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of online services online that help you outsource some of your work. So something that we've done is between game launches, we want to make sure that we maintain a relationship with our journalists. Uh, and we want to supply them something with, with, with something that they might like and enjoy and take away. So we actually reached out to uh, top journalists and we created caricature arts based on their user profiles on different social networks. So again, we didn't want to, you know, we didn't have anything to promote or uh, uh, push to, towards them. We just wanted to say thank you, and so we created these cool uh, personas based on their user profiles. Some of, this, uh, some of them really, really loved it and it allowed us to share it with our fans. Some of them appreciated it, you know, but kept it uh, to themselves. So again, just think of how you can maintain that relationship with journalists and what kind of content can you create that you can outsource using existing online services that probably won't cost you too much. Uh, and going back to what I said, you don't necessarily have to create new content. You can take existing content, whether it's your game art, and include people within that game art just to make, make it more alive. Uh, you can take uh, you know, quotes, famous quotes that journalists may have said and package it a little bit differently, send it back to them. Again, they appreciate this stuff because you're not, you're not necessarily pushing something towards them. You're giving them value and something that they can share with their audience. So going behind the scenes, uh, in many cases, uh, developers sort of start pitching out about their game once the game is ready, once it's packaged, the, the graphics look good, uh, and they think it's ready to go. I personally like showing the whole behind the scenes work. What does the development studio look like? What do they do on their free time? Uh, bringing that whole corporate culture back into the mix. Uh, because you're not necessarily promoting a game. And, and this might be something that a lot of people don't realize. When you're pitching out a journalist, they don't really care what the game looks like or what it feels like. Or There's tons of them. They want to know what the story is, who worked behind it, what did the team do, where did they come from, what does your office look like? Give them something that they can attach to. So using online services such as Instagram, uh, Snapchat, or Periscope, which is now becoming one of my personal uh, favorites, uh, give them that behind the scenes look. Start with something small. If, if you know, you're uncomfortable being on video, try uh, an Instagram channel, build that up, and uh, it makes a world of difference. It's, it's just like, you know, opens up a whole new world to, your, to, uh, the, to the media. So create personas. Uh, beyond the games that we actually have, uh, we actually have, you know, main characters for each of our games, or so-called main characters that we put in the forefront. Uh, so to give these guys a, a little bit more life and to connect with our audience a little bit better, we actually created uh, Twitter profiles for each of our six main characters. Uh, and it's interesting because each of these guys has more followers than I do. So, uh, so Captain O'Malley uh, is uh, the uh, captain of Pirates uh, Tides of Fortune. Uh, Jack Black is uh, the lead soldier of uh, Soldiers Inc. And uh, King Leone uh, Leonidas is, well, the king of uh, Sparta War of Empires with 19,600 followers. But it's not just a question of putting their picture up there and writing the same type of content. You really have to figure out who these people are. What would this character say you know, at any given time of the day? We create a world, a, a world around them, and that's how we engage with our audience. That's when we tell them that we have game updates. That's when we tell them that we have new missions for them to, to, uh, to take part in uh, or invite them to, uh, you know, to, to try new games we really build this whole world around each of these characters and bring them to life. So how does this actually work uh, in the real world? Well, this was one of uh, Captain O'Malley's uh, posts uh, where it was, I guess, a cat, catter day. <laughs> and she invited uh, the player's pets to take part in the challenges. So we try to keep it fun, we try to keep it light, and always think of what is the user voice, or what is the voice of this persona? Who are they, where did they come from? What's their backstory? And uh, for the, for the users especially, this makes a big, big difference because they really engage with these people on that personal level. They connect with them as if this was a real character. So targeted events. Obviously, we're all at this event today. It's a big event. There's a lot of huge events. Uh, but budgets don't always permit being at the big events, especially for indie developers. So something that I really suggest is looking into targeted events. They might not even be gaming related. Uh, if you have a car game, 
check out the local car shows uh, within your, you know, your area. Uh, if you have a fantasy uh, type game, why not go to uh, Dragon Con? Again, not gaming related, but highly related to your audience. Um, uh, Geek Girl Con is another personal favorite of mine. Uh, obviously, there's no lack of fantastic women in this industry, developers, designers, uh, talented people. Figure out if that event si uh, fits your, your audience and, and try to engage with them there. Go talk at these events. You'll meet media. There's a lot of uh, specific media uh, within each of these targeted events. So go there, check them out, and engage with them. Uh, beyond that, how should you actually leverage these events or make the most of it? Well, first of them, invite your uh, fans to demo at these events. If you do have some core fans that are in that area, invite them over. Bring them to the event. Have them demo your game. Sometimes the fans can present your game better than you will. So get them to demo at your events. Uh, invite them to visit your offices. Uh, this is something that is actually do, uh, done a lot with YouTubers, uh, especially in North America. You, the top YouTube, YouTubers are invited to uh, visit the offices, to uh, create videos within the office, to play the games. And again, they're creating a lot of content and a lot of exposure for that brand uh, within the actual office space. Send them personalized giveaways. Going back to what I said earlier, try to cre create giveaways. It could be physical, it could be virtual, images. Uh, create giveaways, send them over to your core fans. Uh, and those are some of the uh, takeaways they should be uh, leveraging when it comes to targeted events. Create an event. Uh, so if you can't really find an event that fits your niche or something specific to what you want to do, figure out if you can create an event around your game or your brand. Try to connect with other brands that are similar to yours and to make something a little bit more impactful. Uh, there's nothing that gamers really love more than connecting with other gamers. It doesn't have to be a big elaborate event like the uh, Blizzard, uh, BlizzCon events. You can create something local. Uh, you can you know, definitely try to put something together using Meetup or Facebook uh, events doesn't have to be huge, but it, it is uh, something that helps you create more content that you can then leverage through your social presences. So here's an example of something that we try to do with each of our game launches, uh, starting with Stormfall, which we launched a few months ago. We always try to create a real physical connection with our game. So when we launch a game, sending out a press release definitely, you know, in most cases, isn't enough, uh, or it's not that impactful at this point. Uh, so we try to create a real physical product. We try to find something that we can actually send journalists, the media, in, you know, our top gamers that they can hold that's tangible and that creates a real connection between them and our games. So for Stormfall, we created a big, or we ordered this big chalice and we had a handwritten scroll in there uh, that fit the game's theme. We sent this, the, these out specifically to journalists and media that we wanted to, uh, to connect with. A lot of them uh, replied back that they really enjoyed it. They were actually taking turns reading out the scroll uh, as if they were from the land of Stormfall. Uh, and it was uh, you know, definitely a big connection to them. And you know, obviously, they're not going to share it on their, their, their blogs or their sites. But for them, when they receive something that's tangible from you, from you guys, that connects to that world of gaming, that is something that helps you stand out above the rest. There's no doubt about it. Number 10, syndicate your content. So something that we thought about at Plarium, uh, when I joined, at least we were thinking about, okay, should we create a blog? Should we create content and put it out there? But when you really think about it, why would any reader really come to your site's, uh, to your site's blog? It's not like you know, it's uh, journalistic news. It's not like cutting edge information. But at the same time, that content is important. So one of the strategies that we like to think about is how can we create content and, not my fault. How can we create content that is engaging, that people will want to read, but not necessarily have to come to our site to get it? So we create guest posts, a lot of guest post content that delivers value to our journalists, to the media that they'll want to read, they'll want to come back to. Plus, you're connecting with your audience, so they're discovering your game. Uh, and another uh, marketing channel or another PR channel that you should be utilizing is content syndication. So read up about it. Take a look. This is going to make a big, big difference for you guys. Uh, you know when you see those related or posts you might like? Well, that's content syndication. And you're getting a lot of exposure for your brand, for your games that way. And you don't necessarily have to get them to come back to your website. So if you're creating good content, think about offering them as guest posts or syndicating your content. Tons of exposure at a very, very minimal effort. Oh. All right, so a few quick takeaways. Uh, first of all, like I said earlier, leverage video. Uh, to deliver your brand story. This could be s video around your game, images. You know, it's amazing the effect that video has on Facebook, and this is something that I've been realizing fairly recently. 
video is much more engaging on Facebook specifically than images, so experiment with that. Uh, look at some of the top hashtags that are available, such as Screenshot Saturday, Gaming News, or hashtag Gameplay. These are some of the top tags being used on Twitter. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of brands are now putting hashtags within the title of their press releases. So you might want to put hashtag new game, blah, 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 whatever. So hashtags within titles of press releases, which you probably wouldn't have thought of, works very, very well. Don't overlook podcasts or music. These are huge channels with very uh, limited uh, competitors. Get on there, try to leverage the music around your games. Figure out on YouTube, if you've already posted a video, are people talking about the soundtrack of your game? This is something that we kind of uh, realized recently. We posted a uh, teaser for one of our new games. And people were asking about the sound behind it. Who's the composer, composer? Where can they find the music? So people were talking more about the music than the actual uh, you know, the images. So obviously, sound is a big way to go. Uh, find or create the right event. So leverage meetup, Facebook events. Figure out if there's local events in your area where there's going to be journalists or media that are going to cover that event. And again, since you might be a, a, a gaming company, uh, you're probably going to stand out from the, from the rest. And you might want to have a, you know, connect with them in the, on, at those events. Deliver valuable content. So infographics, interviews, the design process. Uh, it's not just always about delivering you know, the story about your game, lo game launch. Uh, sometimes the fact that a game didn't work is also a good news story. So putting it out there, we, this is what we learned from our past failure. You know, obviously, you could think of stuff that's already out there and how you can leverage that. Last but not least, track everything. So there's really no reason not to track your analytics, your, your success, who's reading uh, your articles, what journalists have picked up on them, uh, what media uh, channels have they been on, uh, figure out what content is working, and try to build up from there, optimize that process. That was me, thank you very much.